Well, Charlotte's skyline, speaking of growth, will be growing again. A new luxury hotel will be coming to town in late 1990. The Omni Hotel chain was chosen from a field of six Canada's to build a new hotel on South College Street. It's another big step for uptown development, but as Rich Murphy reports tonight, many feel a new convention center is still missing. With its increasing significance both nationally and internationally, we will be ready to market the hotel and the city to an ever-widening audience. They were looking nowhere but up this morning at the announcement of a new Omni Hotel in Charlotte. The 22-story, 425-room luxury hotel will be built adjacent to Uptown's newest skyscraper, the First Union Center. The two buildings will be connected by a retail mall that is also planned for the project. Over a thousand jobs are expected to be created during the construction phase of the project. Once completed, the new Omni should employ between 250 to 300 people. The railroad tracks will be incorporated into the construction of the building. The tracks will go beneath the grand ballroom of the hotel. There will be plenty of meeting rooms, but not enough to make up for the convention business that is already passing Charlotte by. There is one uh, missing link, however, and that link is a larger and more useful convention center. Charlotte is losing between 15 to 20 conventions a year because the current center just isn't big enough. That's 7 to $10 million that's going somewhere else. If we don't plan for a quality convention center in downtown Charlotte, we will slow the growth that, that's positioned to come here. There are many obstacles to the development of a new convention center. The main one, money. Where will it come from? The Chamber of Commerce is in the middle of an economic impact study which will be shown to the city council in March. Meanwhile, it will be up to hotels like the Omni to handle smaller business meetings while the larger conventions take their business somewhere else. Rich Murphy, News 36. You know, traffic is once again moving very slowly away from the Charlotte Coliseum. Heavy attendance has meant delays, and Rich Murphy reports tonight we may have to live with it. At 4.30 this afternoon, it was easy to get into the Coliseum. But two and a half hours later, and it's a familiar scene. 8,000 cars moving through one entrance is going to create some backups. There are lines at halftime both at the concessions and in the restroom facilities because those facilities, you can't design a facility for the, the, the peak uh, use of that. The same is true with the road system. Camp says the road system was adequately designed, but alternatives are being looked at. One is a new exit that would feed directly into Billy Graham Parkway, but merging traffic would still create a backup. Adding a dollar to the ticket price might eliminate the need to stop and pay parking fees, but it would also take away the incentive to carpool. The NBA's other expansion team, the Miami Heat, has traffic problems of its own. Camp has heard horror stories of a three-hour backup. We, we, we may be a little bit spoiled here. I think we have a pretty good situation. But the true judges of the traffic problems are the fans. Are the Hornets worth the wait? When you have 24,000 people show up, you know, you're going to have traffic problems. That, from everything I've heard about other cities, uh, you know, I, th I think we're probably uh, doing as well as anybody, and especially when you consider we've got a sold-out crowd every game. The parking lot was designed to empty out in one hour. The average now is just 45 minutes. For now, that wait is just a price to pay for a successful NBA team. Rich Murphy, News 36. Well, just... A two-and-a-half-year search is over. After leading police on two high-speed chases in the past 10 days, Oda Short is in Gaston County Jail tonight. And as Rich Murphy reports, police are relieved no one was hurt when they captured the armed fugitive. He evaded police for over two-and-a-half years, but Oda Short is finally in custody. He is accused of murder, bank robbery, and shooting at police officers. During his court appearance, Short mumbled and had to ask the judge what month it was. Short surrendered to police in McDowell County Sunday evening after leading them on a 100-mile-per-hour chase in this stolen car. Short reportedly stole it from a woman at gunpoint after his own vehicle broke down. After a chase, he came out of the car with his hands up, a loaded automatic rifle in one of them. Police are glad he gave up peacefully. Exhilaration, the fact that it's over, we can go back to our regular jobs and uh, that he's taken into custody and nobody was hurt. The arrest came just 10 days after Short escaped from police during a high-speed chase on I-85. Short is accused of the murder of Jimmy Black at this convenience store in May 1985. Black was shot in the back with a shotgun, his body left by the dumpster. No money was taken from the store on the night Jimmy Black was shot. Family and friends say they hope a trial will provide some answers for his murder. The keys were in his back pocket. No one entered the store. That's, that's the, uh, the oddity of the situation. 
uh, that no attempt was made to gain entry to the store. He was just shot. If the boy done it, I hope he suffers. And uh, Jimmy was a pretty good old boy. They didn't. Nobody had nothing against the boy. He's, he's easy going. Short is also accused of a Gastonia bank robbery in December. According to family members, Short has been in Georgia for the past two years, a foreman on a dairy farm. He returned to this area late last year. Short is being held tonight without bond at the Gaston County Jail. His next court appearance is set for February 8th. Rich Murphy, News 36, Gastonia. Hello, Charlotte Police. You're watching News 36 on WPCQ Charlotte. Plans for a new home for some retarded adults have run into a snag tonight. As News 36's Rich Murphy reports, a road widening plan has apparently squeezed the badly needed group home right off their property. Ram, this symbolizes yeah. your bedroom, your home. Melissa Morton's new house was supposed to be on this property. She and five other retarded women have been waiting a long time for a home of their own. Through donations, the United Methodist Association for the Retarded, or UMAR, raised money to build that home, a place where these women can be taken care of when their parents are no longer able. Saturday was supposed to be the groundbreaking, but at the last minute progress forced a change of plans. We sent out 450 invitations for this groundbreaking and found out the day after that that uh, the city was proposing to take two lanes out of the lot we had purchased where we anticipated building this house. The city has been planning to widen Idlewild Road for a few years. In August of 88, they also decided this intersection needed widening by one lane. It is still undetermined which side of the road that lane will go on, but with 25 to 30,000 cars a day traveling this way, the group decided it would be better to build this home somewhere else. The group thought they did everything right when they bought this property for $15,000 a year and a half ago. At that time, we may have indicated that, that there may not have been any improvements indicated now, but that doesn't mean that there's no improvements for the future. Whenever you buy a piece of property along a busy road like Idlewild Road, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be affected by road construction. Now, Umar bought what might be considered less sought-after property because some people are not always that receptive to a group home in their neighborhood. There is already a group home close by. The area seemed ideal, but they didn't take Charlotte's growth into account. If it's, if it's located along one of those major streets, check. Ch check yourself. For Nancy Johnson, her new home is delayed until another piece of property can be found. I've been waiting for this ever since I was 16. And how old are you now? 26. And until a new site can be found, Nancy Johnson will still be waiting. Rich Murphy, News 36. Contract talks ended on The red measles outbreak continues in this area. Cabarrus County is reporting one to three new cases a day. A limited quarantine is still in effect on all social activities there. It's put a halt to school athletics, and as Rich Murphy reports tonight, it's starting to hurt the sports revenues as well. The only basketball being played in this gym is during P.E. and varsity practice. Northwest Cabarrus hasn't played against another school since the Red Measles outbreak forced a quarantine. The basketball coach says inter-squad practices are getting old. It's real hard, you know, for them to concentrate without having something to shoot for. And it just to go and practice day after day without playing, uh, it's hard to get a good effort. And the measles have ruined the last season for many seniors. Uh, far as basketball goes, Ain't really no use. I don't really want to play. I mean, so I'm waiting on it to get, uh, cancel it. That's about it. Now, another place schools are hurting because of the red measles outbreak is in revenue. Northwest Cabarrus, for example, depends on the gate money from basketball to supply all its other spring sports. Without that gate money, tennis, baseball, and track are hurting. Northwest Cabarrus estimates it's lost $10,000 since the basketball season was forced to stop. The money to fund spring sports is going to have to come from somewhere else. Schools want to hold the games without spectators, so at least the teams can stay in shape. But the health department says the 1 in 20 failure rate of the vaccine is too great for that risk. People just don't realize how contagious red measles can be. Someone sneezes on one side of the mile as you're walking by on the other, and they've got measles, and they're infected and don't know it yet, and you don't have any immunity, you'll become infected. Until counties can go two weeks without a case, the quarantine will stay in effect. School will stay in session, but athletics will stay on hold. The teams hope the red measles are gone by tournament time. 
In Cabarrus County, Rich Murphy, News 36. A medical... F in at least 55 counties. Well, students in Cabarrus County are elated tonight. The red measles quarantine they've been living under has been lifted. As Rich Murphy reports, the lack of social activities has caused school spirit to suffer. Okay. The quarantine notices at Northwest Cabarrus High School are finally coming down. And none too soon for the school's wrestling team. It's been over a month since they competed in front of spectators. The red measles quarantine that prohibited social activities put their winning season on hold. Last week, they were allowed to wrestle under some unusual conditions. Whenever you wrestle uh, without a crowd, you get to hear sounds that you don't really hear with crowds. It, it, it's just uh, strange. It's, the silence is unnerving. The wrestlers are looking forward to the edge a cheering crowd provides. For me, I think it'll be kind of like the first match of the year because it's been so long since we've had spectators. Well, we had a, um, a match at uh, East Grand and in their field house, and that was just like a practice instead of a real match. It was just, you know, all dull and dreary. Basketball has also suffered during this quarantine. There's nothing that builds enthusiasm like a big game. And without that, the students haven't had much to look forward to. That's probably the biggest part of high school. It's going to the games, you know, on your team. It's part of having school spirit. And we've cheered for the players without spectators, and that was pretty dull. I mean, we cheered for them, but nobody was there to get involved with us. Northwest Cabarrus resumes its basketball season at home Wednesday night against East Rowan. The wrestling team's next match is Thursday night, and there's no doubt the crowds will be cheering them on with an enthusiasm that's been pent up for months. In Cabarrus County, Rich Murphy, News 36. Still ahead tonight, news from the Western Carolinas. Champion... Finally tonight, a new program here in Charlotte is helping some retarded adults find real wage-earning jobs. As Rich Murphy reports tonight, with the help of an area of business, these individuals are becoming valuable members of the community. The ESM Corporation builds computer cables and wiring systems. But this high-tech company is also providing an opportunity for some lower-functioning adults. Kathy Helms is 24 and severely retarded. But ESM allows her to earn wages just like the rest of its workers. Our awareness of the handicap situation in Charlotte has uh, grown due to St. Mark's being here and they've provided us with a service as well as us being able to provide them with a service. These students from St. Mark's Center come to ESM during the week to assemble computer cables. But they are not only building parts, they are building friendships. They interact with the people that work here and as a result of that, they've really blossomed in a lot of ways. Their abilities to communicate have really become expanded since they've been here. And just their general disposition overall, they seem much happier now. And the employees at ESM, like John Rucker, are learning they really aren't that different after all. The main thing is that they're not really handicapped that they can work. There's jobs that they can do, and they're good at it. Now I've got a good attitude. We enjoy them being here. This program is one of the first of its kind in the area. St. Mark's Center hopes to expand this service through many other businesses. The rewards it offers are great. Just ask Janet. What do you like about having a job? It gives me something to do. There you go. Rich Murphy, News 36. Well, teachers marching uptown to let it be known they are... Occupational safety and health investigators are trying to determine why a construction trench caved in yesterday and killed two workers. As Rich Murphy reports tonight, an OSHA regulation on pipe construction was apparently ignored. It took over seven hours to uncover the tons of dirt that buried Jim Hawkins and Robert Turner. The two construction workers were in the 15-foot deep trench, preparing it for sewer pipe. The earth from the sides of the ditch collapsed, they died within minutes. This morning, investigators looked for clues as to why the red clay collapsed. One question raised is why wasn't the hole shored? OSHA has specific regulations about how a trench should be braced when it's deeper than five feet. This crew is laying sewer pipe for a new development in York County. They say shoring regulations are rarely followed. Now how, and how deep is this now? 17 foot. And you have no qualms about climbing in there? Nah. Nah. 
Yeah, everything's stout and good. Now, if the dirt is soft or it looks like it's going to be a problem, the pipe layers will use this. It's called a trench box, and right now it's laying on its side. What they do is they'll drop it in the ground so that these heavy metal walls are pushing against either side of the ditch. That way it keeps the dirt from possibly caving in on top of them. But using the trench box creates the same problem as putting up braces. It slows down work. Most time it's going to go with production other than anything else, so I guess just getting it done. If violations on yesterday's accident are found, fines could range up to $10,000 per violation. In York County, Rich Murphy, News 36. And that could be the theme up in the North Carolina mountains tonight. Sugar Mountain Ski Resort was transformed into a movie set today. And as Rich Murphy reports tonight, just like skiers, the film crew was hoping for snow. When you make a movie on a ski slope, conditions dictate certain things. Boom microphones work better with the proper mitten. A well-groomed surface is essential, and it's very important to keep the actors warm. But once these things are taken care of, Sugar Mountain is a pretty good place to shoot a scene. Yeah, this open sequence is a, a kind of a escape sequence. This uh, family is trying to escape from this uh, country, uh, the USA in the near future, into a supposed to be the Canadian border. The father of this fleeing family is killed, and that's where the movie The Handmaid's Tale begins. The story is about what happens to the wife, actress Natasha Richardson, after she and her daughter escape over the wall to Canada. The climate of North Carolina is ideal for this production. That's why I picked uh, uh, this area of North Carolina, because we're trying to get two seasons, or actually three seasons. The winter season for the beginning of the picture, then the spring season in uh, Durham, and then hopefully in April get some good summer weather and uh, shoot the summer sequences. And the end of the picture is again in the snow, which we hopefully get tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Yes, they do have to blow snow on this slope, but packed powder isn't as important to movie crews as it has been to North Carolina skiers. But the producers have been paying close attention to the ski reports. I've been watching this gentleman's television set every day in the afternoon, and uh, we got lucky, I must say. You know, it was uh, exactly what we want. That's what we got. Hopefully, uh, by doing this, people are going to realize, hey, Sugar Mountain's got enough snow to make a movie up there on the snow, so it must be pretty good. The top slope was closed today for filming, but skiers will have their own chance to escape when it reopens this weekend. At Sugar Mountain, Rich Murphy, News 36. Airport maintenance crews have been working steadily since the snow began falling early Thursday morning, but their around-the-clock diligence paid off and no flights were delayed because of snow on the runways. Rich Murphy reports their hard work has kept Charlotte Douglas on schedule. Passengers waiting in ticket lines this morning didn't know how hard crews were working to ensure them a safe takeoff. The snow plows have been running since early Thursday morning, helping to keep the runways clear. Uh, Roger, I'm on the ramp. I'm going to head through the tunnel and go down uh, Alpha to approach in uh, 36 left. Don Hicks is in charge of airfield maintenance. This morning, he took us on a condition check of runway 36 right. Looking for accumulation of snow on the runway, snow and ice. About 3 this morning, we closed our left side runway started uh, pushing snow on it, clearing the snow off the runway to prepare for the inbound flights. This morning, we were able to have all three runways clear of large accumulations of snow by 7 a.m. After years of clearing snow at Charlotte Douglas, Hicks has confidence in his crews. We know our abilities, and uh, when it gets to the point where we have to shut down, when it becomes dangerous, we shut down. After working 24 hours, crews grab a break at the maintenance facility. Working overnight in the snow presented some additional problems. Last night I heard it was about like a, a half a mile of visibility, so we had to be very alert. They had to keep contact with the control rooms a whole lot during most of the evening. And although they're tired, the job isn't finished. We got to keep rolling. <laughs> Sleep later. The only delays today were due to de-icing. At Charlotte Douglas, Rich Murphy, News 36. 
Well, it's been almost two years since a sexual scandal forced Jim Baker to leave PTL. Today, the woman that was part of that downfall had her first chance to tour the empire she helped crumble. As Rich Murphy reports, Jessica Hahn waited a long time to see Heritage USA. You are FX and Fox, John Boy and Billy, open line with Jessica Hahn. Jessica Hahn started her day by blasting Jim Baker on a radio call-in show. Jim Baker is exactly what you think he is. <laughs> How's that? She returned to Charlotte as part of a promotional tour. After lunch, she couldn't resist having the limo driver cruise through Heritage USA. The woman that hit on the floorboard of a car the last time she drove through here received a personal greeting today. Sure. Can you tell me what you want to see? Yeah. And reason, a little... Visitors looked on as Han and the crowd of media strolled through an empty Main Street, USA. It reminds me of a Disneyland in a way. So this is where Jerry Falwell slid down. coming up. Be careful. I, am, I have so little to do with this story. It's, it's unbelievable, but everybody assumes I, you know... I'm the one who brought it down, but how, how am I going to bring this place down? Tourists with little else to do became autograph hounds, even requesting Han's signature on her Playboy pictorial. The former church secretary says she is just a small part of Jim Baker's downfall, and even longtime supporters say Baker is not innocent. The, the lust of man. That's right. The lust. Of course, she was nice looking. He fell for her, and he couldn't resist it. But look what he lost. Today, the empire that Baker built was nearly deserted. And it was not Jim and Tammy, but Jessica Hahn driving off in a limousine. At Heritage USA, Rich Murphy, News 36. A bizarre mutilation of farm animals is being investigated in Caldwell County tonight. Seven dairy calves were stabbed repeatedly while in their holding pens. Our Rich Murphy reports residents there are stunned. And I came on up to feed them. Well, they always just run and stick their little old heads out of these holes to get their milk. Mildred Hatley began her chores as usual Saturday morning. As she approached the holding pen to feed her calves, she noticed it was too quiet. And I had begun to wonder, so I just looked in here, and the one in here was stabbed to death, just stabbed full of holes, and was laying there dead. Seven of her Jersey dairy cows were stabbed, two already dead, laying in a pool of blood. A third had to be put to sleep yesterday. The remaining four have been stitched up and hopefully will be okay. Hatley can't imagine what type of person would do this to such a harmless animal. I, I don't even like for my mind to even, it crossed my mind that the human race is that low down. I mean, the human, a human can be that low down. This is not the first time that someone has mutilated Mildred Hatley's farm animals. Back in September on two separate Friday evenings, someone went into the chicken house and killed nearly 100 baby chicks by cutting them in half. These look like they two had just taken a knife and cut them down across the back and pulled them apart. Some of them looked like they just took a hold of them and pulled their heads off. Police are questioning suspects in the calf killings. There are possible leads and clues left behind. Hatley believes it had to be someone familiar with her farm because the pens were only built six weeks ago. In the meantime, she is fighting back her feelings. That's one thing I got to do is not have that hate down in my heart for somebody. I got to love their soul, but hate the deeds that they've done. In Caldwell County, Rich Murphy, News 36. Well, today's parade had some special meaning for local Vietnam vets. Our inside story, Karen Church joins us with a look at why this year's celebration is different for one Charlotte Vietnam veteran. Karen? Well, Tom and Jesse, today we're going to do something a little bit differently. Photographer Rich Murphy and I are going to show you the thoughts of Vietnam vet Bernie Lee. I look at America like, like I do my children, right or wrong, I'm going to defend it. And if need come, I'd do it again. if you can really explain what that means. It's been a long time coming, I think. I don't know, it's, it just means everything to us. OK, 
Okay, machine gun, move up. Right over here. When you get a service like this, it's, it's just, it's a message to everybody. People can live together, you know. You don't have to kill each other. Journalists are not supposed to be without words to describe events like this, but I think Bernie Lee summed up his experience in the Vietnam War much better than I could. Tom Jesse. All right, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Among those marching in today.